Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And in the current module, we are discussing about the genetic material. What we have discussed so far, we have discussed about the discovery of genetic material by doing the different types of experiments. So, initially, there were two prominent uh, candidate for the genetic material. One is the nucleic acid, the second is the proteins. And there was long debate about which material is actually going to serve the uh, serve the purpose of having a potential to be genetic material. We have discussed about the different types of experiments th through which the scientists have uh, you know proved that it is actually the genetic nucleic acid which is actually been the most acceptable material for genetic material. So, within the nucleic acid, it could be DNA or the RNA. Mostly the cells are actually having the genetic material in the form of DNA, whereas in some of the organisms such as viruses, you are also going to have the RNA as the genetic material. Then in the previous lecture, we have discussed about the uh, genomic organizations and how the genetic material is actually going to be organized in the different types of organisms. So, we have discussed about the uh, organization of the genetic gen genome organization in the uh, in the uh, prokaryotic cell and we have discussed about how the different types of uh, 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 materials are required for genomic organization in the prokaryotes, what are the properties of the genome into the prokaryotic structures. We have taken an example of E. coli and how the compactation is happening inside the E. coli cell and so on. Now, in subsequent today's lecture, we are going to discuss about the genomic organization into the eukaryotic cell and how the different types of chromosomes are being found. So, in the genomic organization, when we talk about the genomic organization in the eukaryotic cell, we are having the genomic genome which is present in two places in the eukaryotic cell. One is the nucleus and the second is the organelles. So, if it is a plant cell, it is actually, so within the organelle, you can have the two different types of organelle where the genomic content is going to be present. One is called as the mitochondria and the second is the chloroplast. So, you can, genomic or genome is actually been organized within the eukaryotes in the nucleus. So, you, within the nucleus, you are going to have the different types of chromosomes and within the mitochondria also you are going to have the mitochondrial chromosome and the chloroplast chromosomes and summation of these DNA material is actually going to be called as the genome within the organisms. Now, within the genome organization in the eukaryotes, so the genome, eukaryotic genome is linear and confront the western crit double click cell structural model. It is embedded in the nucleosome complex DNA and protein structure that packed together to form the chromosomes. Eukaryotic genome have unique feature of exon intron organization of the protein coding genes representing the coding sequence and the intervening sequences that represent the functionality of the RNA inside the uh, genome. A human haploid cell consists of the 23 different chromosomes and one mitochondrial chromosomes contain more than 3.2 billion DNA base pairs. Remember that in the case of the pro prokaryotic structure, we were talking about the number of chromosome in the case of millions, but here the number of chromosomes are going to be in billions. That is why there is a more higher level of compactation is required so that that particular DNA is going to be fit into the small tiny uh, nucleus. Now, as far as the uh, chromosomes, so eukaryotic chromosomes are usually linear in structure. So, this is the eukaryotic one of the eukaryotic chromosomes and a typical chromosome is 10 of millions to hundreds of millions of bases pair in length. Eukaryotic chromosomes occurs in set, many species are deployed which means that the somatic cells contain two set chromosomes, two sets of the chromosomes, right. So, you are going to have the chromosomes which are present in the sets, right? And so, double set is present inside the cell and during the duplications or during the division, one set is actually going to be shared with the daughter cells. 
Each chromosome contains a centromere that forms the recognition site for the kinetochore complex. So, this is the centromere, right? This is the centromere, uh, and this is the place which is actually going to be recognized by the kinetochore proteins. Then we have the telomeres, which contain the specialized sequences located at the end of the linear chromosome. So, these are the telomeres, uh, which are going to be two telomeres. So, and uh, this is the specialized sequences which are present on the uh, tails or the corners of the chromosomes. Then we have the repetitive sequence which are found in near the centromeric regions. So, these are the uh, DNA or the genes, how the genes are actually being organized onto the chromosome. For example, this is a classical example how the MSC proteins are or MSC genes are being organized onto the chromosomes within and uh, you see that you have HLA typing and all that and uh, this is a particular type of chromosomes. What is the chemical composition of the chromosome or the chromatin? So, you are going to have the DNA, you are going to have the RNA and then you are also going to have the proteins. So, you are going to have the DNA which is 20 to 30, 40 percent. So, most important constituent of the chromatin. Then you are going to have the RNA which is going to be 5 to 10 percent. It is associated with the chromatin as the transfer RNA, messenger RNA or the ribosomal RNA. So, it is actually be a part of the expression machinery and then you are also going to have the proteins. So, that is going to be 50 to 60 percent. So, mostly the chromatin is actually uh, made up of, of the DNA plus protein and uh, it is uh, mostly the 40 percent is actually going to be DNA and 60 percent is actually going to be the protein. Uh, within the protein you are going to have the two different types of proteins, you are going to have the histone proteins or the non-histone proteins. So, histone proteins very basic proteins constitute about 60 percent of the total protein almost it is present in the 1 is to 1 ratio with the DNA and you are going to have the five different types of histone proteins H1, H2A, H2B, H3 and H4. Similarly, you are going to have the non-histone protein, they are 20 percent of the total chromatin protein and they are required for the nucleosomal assembly proteins such as NAP and the other uh, histone chromatin remodeling complexes. And then you are going to have the structural proteins such as actin, tubulin and myosin which and the contractile protein and all the enzymes. So, uh, the contribution of the non-histone protein is very, very little compared to the histone protein. Histone protein is required for packaging. So, histone is a positively charged protein. So, these are the basic proteins which means they are actually going to be positively charged protein and that is why they are actually going to have the instant attraction for the negatively charged DNA. So, this is the DNA, right? You know that the DNA is negatively charged because of the uh, phosphate backbone. So, the histones are found in all the eukaryotic cells. They are commonly present in the histone, uh, commonly present histone in the eukaryotic cells are H1, H2A, H2B, H3 and H4. Then uh, these all the five histones are being categorized into the two uh, structural uh, regions. One is called as the core histone, the other one is called as the linker histone. So, the H2A, H2B, H3 and H4 are part of the core histone whereas, the H1 is actually being called as the linker histone. So, core histone, the two copies of the core histone form the protein core around which the DNA is wrapped and within this you are going to have the H2A, H2B, H3 and H4. Whereas, the linker histone it is not the part of the core protein, but it is associated with the linker DNA which links the two nucleosides. So, within the histone you are going to have the core histone and the linker histone. The core histone you are going to have the two copies of the H2A, H2B, H3 and H4 which are actually going to form the core of the nucleosome and then this core is actually going to wrap the DNA, right? So, it is going to have the clear attraction because all these uh, histones are going to be positively charged. So, their surface is actually going to be positively charged and that is how they are actually going to have the very high affinity for the DNA. Similarly, you are going to have the linker histone which is going to be H1. So, how these uh, how histone proteins are or what are the different properties of the histone proteins? 
so histones are closely associated with the negatively charged protein uh, dna they have the high content of positively charged amino acids such as lysine and arginine so you have the core histones and you have the linker histones core histone h2a you're going to have the molecular weight of 14 kilo dalton and it is actually going to be a lysine rich Similarly, you can have the H2B. It's going to be approximately 14 kilo dalton, and it is the slightly lysine rich. Okay. Then we have the H3. H3 is going to be 15 kilo dalton. It is going to be lysine rich, and uh, you have the H4, which is going to be 11 kDa, and it is going to be arginine rich. Then we have the linker histone, which is H1, and it is going to be 20 kDa, and it is also arginine rich. So H3 and H4 histones are first form the heterodimer, then come together to form a tetramer with the two other the molecule of H3 and H4. H2 and H2 we form the heterodimers. So this is the uh, sequence in which the histones are actually going to be organized with each other, and that's how they are actually going to form the nucleosomal assembly. So the assembly of nucleosome involves the ordered association of histone with the protein and uh, DNA. So first, the H3, the two molecule of H3 and the two molecule of H4 are actually going to come together, and that's how they are actually going to form a tetramer. Which means you are going to have the like this, right? So you're going to have a tetramer which is going to be formed. Then this tetramer is actually going to because this tetramer is going to have the positive charge, right? So it's going to have a positive charge on the top right and then it is actually going to bind the dna so this means this ball is actually going to have the dna okay and then to after binding the dna then the h2a and h2b is dimer which means the uh, is actually going to join the h3 h4 dna complex and that's how it is actually going to have the nucleosome So this is actually one ball which is going to have the uh, H3H4. DNA and on top of this you are going to have the H2A, H2B, then H2A, H2B like that. Okay, so DNA is actually going to be present inside this particular core. so this one copy of nucleosome is actually going to communicate with the another nucleosome right so this is going to have another copy and this is the region where the h1 is actually going to bind so this is the linker region which is actually going to bind the core histone have the amino acid extensions called as tail because it lacks the defined structural and do not participate in association of dna with the histone octamer the tails are the extensive site for a post translational modification including the methylation acetylation and the phosphorylations the assembly of histosome involves the ordered association of the histone with the dna this is anyway we have discussed right h3h4 followed by the binding of dna followed by the binding of the h2a h2b and that's how the nucleosome is going to be formed so the nucleosome is the starting building block for the higher order organizations so nucleosome is actually the building block of the chromosome right so this is the dna right then it is actually going to form the nucleosome then it is actually going to organized into the chromosomes and then it is actually going to organize into the nucleus so a human cell contains 3 into 10 to the power 9 base pair per haploid set of the chromosome the average thickness of each base pair is 3.4 angstrom this is the thickness of the dna actually so therefore if the dna molecule in a haploid set of chromosome were lay out end to end the total length of the dna molecule would be approximately 1 meter for a diploid set the length is actually the double which is the 2 meter as the diameter of a typical human nucleus is about 10 to 15 micrometer it is obvious that the dna must be compacted by many order of magnitude to fit into such a small space the compactation in human nucleus is done by the nucleosome 
formation by the association of the DNA with the histone. Nucleosomes are packed into successively high ordered structures. So, nucleosome model is scientifical model which explains the organization of the DNA and the associated protein into the chromosome. It also further explains the exact mechanism of the folding of the DNA into the nucleus. This model was proposed by the Kornberg in 1974 and it is the most acceptable model of the chromatin organization. The model was further confirmed by the P audit in 1975. What are the features of the nucleosomal model? In eukaryotic DNA, in eukaryotes, the DNA is tightly bound to the histone protein which leads to the formation of DNA protein particles called nucleosome. Nystone play a very important role in packaging of such a long DNA molecule in the form of a nucleosome into the nucleus only a few micrometer in diameter. Therefore, the nucleosomes are called fundamental packaging unit particle of chromatin and it gives a beads onto a string appearances which means if you see very clearly you will see that the DNA is being packed like this. And this packaging is called as the beads on a string because this is the linker DNA and this is actually the core structure of the histone and that is how these are actually going to be you know fold on to each other. So, it is actually going to be fold like this and that is how you are going to have uh, beads and then it is going to be fold like this and that is how it is actually going to be keep condensing and that is how you are going to have the higher organizations of the packaging. Each nucleosome is a disc shaped particle with a diameter of uh, 100 uh, nanometer and 5.7 nanometer in height containing two copies of each four nucleosome histones such as H2A, H2B, H3 and H4. This histone octamer forms a protein core around which the double standard DNA is uh, wrapped to 1.6 times containing the 146 base pair. Each nucleosome bead is separated from the next by a linker DNA which is, which is generally 54 base pair and contains a single H1 protein. This is what I was talking about, right? So you have a DNA and then it is actually going to be arranged. On average, the nucleosome repeat at an interval of 200 base pair. So, folding of the DNA. So, once the nucleosome is formed, there will be a folding of the DNA and that is how you are going to have the higher compactation of the DNA. The assembly of DNA begins with a newly produced tetramer which is H3H4 that is a particularly modified to form a sub nucleosomal particle. The two HBA tumors are then added. The results in the formation of a nucleosomal core particle with a 146 pair DNA bound to the histone octamer. The nucleosome is made up of, of this central component and the uh, connecting DNA. In order to create the nucleofilament, the nucleosome core must be spaced, spaced regularly which is accomplished during the maturation stage which requires the ATP. The newly integrated histones are deacetylated in this stage. Next, the incorporation of linker stone is accomplished by folding of the nucleofilament into the 30 nanometer fiber, the structure of which remain to be elucidated. Two principal model exist. One is the solenoid model and the other is the zigzag model actually to explain how the DNA is actually going to be folded after forming the nucleosome to form the higher order organizations. Last but not least, further subsequent folding process results in a higher level of structure and distinct domain within the nucleus. So, these are the some of the high, uh, organizations. So, you are going to start with the DNA. DNA is actually going to be fold into the, so if you start with the 2 nanometer, then you are actually going to form the beads on a string form and that is how actually you are going to have the nucleosomes. Then these nucleosomes are actually going to be uh, organized and refolded. The, the, the DNA is actually going to be folded again and that is how you are going to have the 30 nanometer chromatin fibers 
then these 30 nanometer chromatin fibers are actually going to be further organized and they are actually going to form the 300 nanometer fibers and in which these, these uh, solenoids are actually going to be uh, again uh, folded onto each other and that is how you are going to have these 300 nanometer fibers. Then this 300 nanometer fiber is actually going to be condensed and that is how it is actually going to form the 1700 nanometer fiber and uh, you are going to have the condensed region of the chromosome and from this you are going to have the further condensation and as a result it is actually going to form the 1400 nanometer uh, chromosome. So, you are going to have the chromosome. So, you started with DNA, you ended with the chromosome. So, this is the first and this is the last uh, binding style. Okay? Now, in this, uh, this is the packaging of the genome into the eukaryotic system and the genome has a very significant impact on the properties of that particular organisms and the bigger the or uh, genome you are actually going to have, the more of the information what you are going to carry and that is how you are actually going to have the higher flexibility of modulating that information and that is how you are going to have the more properties to handle. So, genome size is related to the complexity of that particular organisms, right? Because higher the information you have, the higher you are actually going to manipulate that information and that is why you are going to have the complexity into the system. This means you are going to, you, you can actually have the freedom to modify the system, uh, proteins, you can actually be able to synthesize the proteins and so on. So, if you see uh, very clearly what you are going to see is you are going to have the prokaryotic species and you are going to have the eukaryotic species. Within the prokaryotic species you will see that the genome size is very small and that is why the number of genes or number of proteins are actually going to be very small. This means they are actually going to produce the less number of proteins. And if you are producing the less number of proteins, you are actually going to have the lower order freedoms to manipulate those proteins because you cannot have the multi-step process. You can have only the two, one or two step process because you, if, if as many number of process you are going to produce, uh, you can actually should have the proteins to regulate these steps. So, that is uh, basically a drawback or I will say simplicity in the system, right? More and more you are actually going to have the genome size. For example, in the case of yeast, you are going to have the genome size which is 12 megabyte, right? And then you will see that the number of genes are going to be significantly very high compared to the mycoplasma. And uh, more and more actually you see that these are the plant species, right? So, they are very, very high and the number of genes what you see here is very high. This means they are actually being able to have the potential of producing the large number of proteins and that is how these large number of proteins can be utilized in such a way that you are actually going to have an event which is tightly regulated at each step and that is how you are actually going to have the, uh, you can actually be able to have the more control over the process. So, the uh, C value or the cot values or the quantity of DNA per haploid genome such as that seen in the nucleus of a spermatozoan is used to describe the genome size in the eukaryotes. Because the size is essentially consistent within the species, it is known as the C value or the, or the characteristics. The mismatch between the C value and the presumed amount of genetic information contained within the genome is called C value paradox. Since we cannot assume that a species processed less DNA than the quantity required to specify its vital function, we have to explain why many species contain this amount of excess DNA. This is very simple actually. If you have excess amount of DNA, you can have the flexibility of producing more number of proteins and that is how you can have the, uh, instead of having the 3 step process, you can have the 20 step process. Because if you increase the number of steps, you are actually going to have the flexibility. You have seen that the gen glycolysis is a 10 step process, Krebs cycle also has the multiple steps and because they have the multiple steps, you can actually have the entry and exit of 
the metabolites at every stage and that is how you are actually going to have the very very complex biochemical uh, uh, reactions. Now, the first question comes if there is a requirement of the protein production for example, if there is a requirement of protein production that is require that the DNA should be free for doing the transcription and translations. So, now question comes how you can be able to uh, unpack the DNA and how you can be able to have the DNA which is available for doing the other kinds of molecular biology activities such as replication, transcription and translations. So, unpackaging of DNA. So, the way we have discussed about the packaging of the DNA the same way the histone has the crucial protein which are actually going to participate into the unpackaging of the DNA or the unwinding of the DNA. So, histone are actually having the tail region right remember that tail region is important for histone to be assembled with each other and that is how they are actually going to bind the DNA. This tail region has the uh, modification site for acetylations, for phosphorylations and the methylations. Now, when you have the acetylation you are actually going to have you are going to produce the negative charge. When you have the phosphorylation, you are going to induce the negative charge and when you have a methylation that also is going to modulate the uh, surface property of that particular protein. So, as soon as you have the acetylation and phosphorylation, you are going to have the unwinding of the chromatin structures and DNA becomes more accessible for the other kinds of downstream applications or other kinds of downstream activities such as replication, transcription and translations. So, acetylation. So, acetylation take place at the lysine residue of K4, K5 in the H4. It take place through an enzyme which is called as histone acetyl transferase or AT. The acetylated chromatins are more open this means they are actually going to be active in terms of the replication and transcription. It is accessible for transcription factor and polymerases. Deacetylation take place by the histone deacetylase or HDAC. The acetyl group donor is acetyl CoA. So, you are going to have the closed chromatin and when you have the activity of the histone acetylase it is actually going to acetylate the chromatins and that is how it is actually going to form the relaxed chromatin. Once the relaxation is over when that process is over then you are actually going to put the HDAC activity which means the histone deacetylate and then it is actually going to be closed chromatin and that is how these are the things which are actually going to occur simultaneously or uh, you know to just to you know unwind the DNA make it accessible so that you can be able to use that DNA and then after that once that process is over then you can actually be able to close that DNA. Same is true for the phosphorylations. So, you are going to have the kinase activity which is actually going to convert the closed chromatin into the relaxed chromatin and then the, you have the phosphatases which are actually going to remove the phosphorylations and that is how it is actually going to reverse the events. Then third is uh, methylation. So, it occurs on the side chain of the lysine and arginine. The methylation does not alter the charge, but it actually changes the charge what is present onto that particular residues. So, lysine can be monomethylated, di or trimethylated. Methylation done by the histone lysine methyl transferase and the histone lysine methyl demethylase. So, you are here also you are going to have the methyl transferase and the demethylase and when you have the methyl transferase the coarse chromatin is going to be converted into the relaxed chromatin and same is going to be reversed by the histone lysine demethylase. So, these are the about the uh, normal chromosome these are the information which is required for the normal chromosomes. But when people were discussing about or when we started investigating the different types of chromosomes they could found that some are the specialized chromosomes which is present in the some of the organisms. So, let us discuss about these specialized chromosomes and how the DNA is packed into these specialized chromosomes and what are the different properties of these specialized chromosomes. So, the first is polyteen chromosomes. So, what are polyteen chromosomes? 
polytene chromosomes which are gigantic chromosomes that grew from a smaller developing chromosomes frequently appear into the slavery gland of diphtherian flies such as Drosophila melanogaster. They are also known as slavery gland chromosome because they were found in slavery glands. The Balbini found the polytene chromosome in the slavery gland nuclei of the um, larva in the 1881. Due to the presence of several chromos uh, chromatin in them, they are known as the polytene chromosomes. Now the question is how these polytene chromosomes are being found. So the most polytene chromosomes are located in the interface nucleus of a few cell in the diphtherian fly larva. Each chromosome component is successfully duplicated as they grow from the chromosome of the duplied nucleus. After each DNA doubling, the later stage of the mitosis are eliminated leading to the development of a polytene chromosome. As a result, the cell cycle is divided into the S phase and G phase. In Drosophila melanogaster, this polytenization, polytenization cell cycle is developed during the mid embryogenesis. DNA strands do not separate at the final stage of each S phase, rather they remain accompanied to one another generating the polytene chromosomes. The process of endor uh, duplications or multiple chromosome DNA replication without adequate chirokinesis and cytokinesis results into the polyteny of gigantic chromosomes. As a result, the guy giant chromosomes are produced which are 70 to 100 times longer than the typical metaphors chromosomes. Morphological features of the polytene chromosomes. So polytene chromosome is a very important thing actually because this is a kind of an exception or kind of the um, uh, structure what is being found in a specific uh, organisms. So there are numerous partially duplicated chromosomes that are almost intervened with each another making up the polytene chromosomes. The heterochromatized centromere of all chromosomes fuse in a centromere. The polytene chromosomes are found in the form of six radiating arms from the chromocenter. You can have the X chromosome, you can have the two chromosomes, two chromosome left arm, right arm, third chromosome, right arm left arm, then you can have the fourth chromosome which is the shortest arm, then you can have the Y chromosomes and, and so on. So an altered pattern of bright and dark is seen when these chromosomes are stained and examined under a microscope. Interband refer to a light pattern which band refer to the dark pattern. So this is a specific uh, polytene chromosomes where you are going to have the right arm, you are going to have left arm, within the left arm you are going to have the uh, left arm of chromosome 2, left arm of chromosome 3, similarly you can have the right chromosome of arm 3 and so. So within this place your centromere you are going to have the divergence and that is how you are going to have the X chromosome and Y chromosomes and so on. The dark. Uh, then you can have the some of the classical uh, characteristics of these chromosomes such as you are going to have the balbini rings. The band undergoes morphological and biochemical changes related to their gene activity and uh, the activation of the genes of a band causes the compact, uh, compact chromatin strands to uncoil and expand outward resulting in a chromosomal puff. The puff contains the DNA loops that are less condensed and the DNA of band elsewhere in the chromosome puffs are active gene of the transcription. So these are the puffs, so chromosomal puffs and these are the active region of the gene expressions. What is the function of the polytene chromosomes? The nuclei of each cell enlarge in size leading to a cell growth. The metabolic benefit of having a numerous copy of a gene allow for a higher expression of the gene expressions. The chromosome in Drosophila melanogaster undergoes numerous round of endo uh, reduplications in order to generate the significant amount of glue prior to pupillations. The bar phenotype which includes the kidney shaped eyes occurs from the tandem duplication of the severe polytene bands 
that are close to the centromere of the X chromosomes due to the fact that the polytene chromosomes are interface chromosomes and are thus transcribed. As a result, it offers a chance to investigate transcription by the direct observation and transcriptional response to the certain stimuli can be observed. So, apart from the lab, the polytene chromosomes, you can also have the another kind of chromosome which is called as Lambrecht chromosomes. So, the Lambrecht chromosomes, what are Lambrecht chromosomes? Lambrecht chromosomes are transcriptionally active chromosomes which are mainly found in the germinal vesicle of large oocytes of many vertebrate and the invertebrate. The Lambrecht chromosomes derive their name from the lateral loop that extrude from the chromosome at a certain point. They are very much transcriptionally active as the emerging DNA from the certain point are rich in RNA polymerases. These chromosomes were first observed by the Fleming and Ruckerts in 1882 in oocyst of the amphibians. Uh, where do these chromosomes occur? The Lambrecht chromosomes occur in the diplotene stage of the prophase 1 of the first meiotic division in the primary oocyst of all the animals and the structure of the Lambrecht chromosomes. So, each RNA polymerase is attached to the nascent RNA and associated protein generating the visible brush like appearance. It can be visualized easily that Lambrecht chromosomes are held in a stretch out form during the diplotin stage of the prophase 1 of the first meiotic division. The axis of Lambrecht chromosome contain array of beads from which the loops are protruding outward called chromosomes. They exist as meiotic bivalent to chromo uh, homologous chromosomes held together by the creosmeter. So, these are the, uh, so in this Lambrecht chromosomes you are going to have the uh, chromosomes, then you are going to have the, uh, the, uh, the RNA polymerase which is protruding towards our, so this is actually going to be a region of single chromosomes and so on. And uh, it is actually going to be transcriptionally very active because these are the region which are actually going to be available for transcription and the translation. So, they contain the symmetrical loops one each other chromatin in a chromosome, their absence of lesion in the centromere region, each loop and uh, each loop bears an axis which made up of a single DNA molecule that is unfold during the RNA synthesis. What is the function of the Lambrecht chromosomes? Loops are useful in chromosomal mapping, then extremely helpful in visualization of gene expression and also the change associated with the transcription. It provides a great proof for the eukaryotic gene amplification which play a crucial role in the oocyte phase development and it is helpful in the hybridization results. Now, at the end we are going to discuss uh, the comparison of the prokaryotic as well as the eukaryotic genome. Many of these properties we have already discussed, right. So, the comparison of the prokaryotic as well as the eukaryotic uh, genome. So, prokaryotic genome is small in size, it is going to be large in the case of eukaryotic genome. Uh, genome is going to be a DNA and a few protein in a simpler manner whereas, GNA in the case of eukaryotic cell the genome is going to be present and the many proteins are involved such as the histone proteins and so on. It contains a single set of chromosome whereas, in the eukaryotes you can have the multiple set of chromosomes. Uh, the amount of DNA is going to be small in the case of prokaryotic genome, it is going to be typically very large number of DNA which is present. Then the prokaryotic genome is polycystronic whereas, in the case of eukaryotic genome it is monocystronic. Then most of the DNA encodes for the protein, so it is actually there is no useless DNA, right? There is no uh, DNA which is not going to be transcribed or which is not going to be translated to the protein, whereas most of the DNA does not code for the DNA protein, right? Uh, it uh, is a very a small portion of the genome which is actually coding for the protein, rest all is non coding regions. Then RNA processing uh, not an option, right? So, RNA processing uh, allows for the several of these genome because you have the non-coding regions, these non-coding region has to be separated from the coding region and that is why the RNA processing is required. And messenger RNA has a short life span whereas, the messenger RNA is long uh, life because uh, the eukaryotic cell requires the 
a continuous synthesis of a protein for several days, right. So, these are the some of the properties of the genome. We have discussed about the prokaryotic genome and the organization of the prokaryotic genome and we have also discussed about the uh, eukaryotic genome and eukaryotic genome organizations. We have discussed about the, uh, the uh, organization of uh, the, the, the proteins of the different proteins which are involved in the nucleosomal assembly and how the nucleosomal assembly is being formed and so on. So, with this brief discussion about the genetic material, uh, we are going to conclude our lecture here. In our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss some more aspects related to molecular biology. Thank you. Mm -hmm.